Hello there, welcome to episode 19 of my tutorial series for Songs of Six. I'm Icon and today we will do our best to set up a situation where we can hire and recruit soldiers. So in the last episode we were already preparing everything we need for our archers. We have set up the Bowyer and the Fletcher and right now we're merely waiting for the the archery range to be completed. It'll take a couple of days and this is no problem at all, considering the fact that we don't have any people to spare right now that we could turn into soldiers anyway. To do this, well, we'll have to help our city out a little bit again. So uh, we still have a lack of certain things. And as you see here, we have nearly 10 people willing to immigrate towards the city. That's really not much. We will need at least 100 people to turn into soldiers to make this whole thing effective, in my humble opinion, at least. So we have a lot of food in our stockpiles. That's a good thing. What's a bad thing, though, is the service situation is making the people unhappy again. So clearly visible, we have a lack of sleeping services and I think we could obviously also handle another canteen. The hygiene services are really well covered. We don't have any drinking services though, but that's more a problem of this than the lack of taverns, so we can't really change that. We could provide another opportunity to give the people more stages, yes, and the lavatory situation could use some relief pun intended. So there's a couple of projects that we can cover here to make things happen better for us. So let's start. This episode's side topic is, of course, there's always side topics, is going to be the adjustment of your city interface between 500 and 1000 people. Because this is the point where your city will grow in an ever-growing and an ever-faster-growing pace. If you do it correctly, you will end up with more people than you should possibly accept in your city. And expanding carefully is here the name of the game. We are now going to head on over into our civics buildings and let's check out the lavatories. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to check out where are these. So there's the first one and there's the other one. So if we zoom on out there, that means we definitely could, well, let's see, there's the number one, there's the number two, so let's consider some placement here. With these service buildings, the most important thing to note is that you always want to have them spread in a way that they get something done for you. I am not entirely sure, but if I read this map correctly, and I've really pondered a long time what this would mean, but I'm reading this like that. When you click your lavatory, you see that there is this uh, weird grid mesh. This grid mesh, I am understanding it like this, wherever you are, you are seeing red grids, that's where the people are looking for some place to fulfill that service or that need. And the blue grid, that shows off where people are all set. So you can, you can uh, consider this as a heat map. So we see here is a, is a tiny center where the people are looking for relief. But here you see there's way more, way more. So we should probably set or set up shop over here. So this is, after all, I think a pretty good spot. Now, to make life as easy as possible and think things uh, as quick as possible, we're going to just use our good friend, the room copier, and set one up here. What do I have here in suspension? In suspension? Ah, another smithy. All right, so we do well, yeah, we are going to activate that job here at the same time because another smithy is now quite necessary because I really don't want to stop providing tools to the city and therefore 
Let's just rather keep that going. We do have one situation here, though. We are out of clay. So let's change something about that. We will check out our import stations. And as you see here by now, I'm using this menu a lot. The larger the city grows, the more helpful I find this. And we are obviously not importing enough clay. So let's import all up to the 50% mark. Don't import too much, because stuff has a spoilage rate. In general, the higher the spoilage rate, the lower should be your imports. But you always have to make sure that your manufacturers are not running dry. That's uh, definitely not worth anything if your people are not getting anything done there. Okay, so we have enough furniture to get both jobs done. Let's just assign a couple of woodcutting jobs just in advance so we don't get into any trouble. And let's subtract five workers from the stone mine to free us up some odd jobbers that we can use. I, I always love to use the stone mine a bit as my buffer, but pretty much every work intense raw resource extraction business does the trick. We could also decide to lower the amount of woodcutters, but since my city always has this tendency to run dry on wood, I'm not really interested. Okay, we got this. Now let's cover a couple of other things. We saw that we were also needing a bit of sleeping service, so let's just build up a another flat house here. So here you have the same kind of heat map situation. We have here a heavy lack of service there. So we're going to set on up a bigger sleeping opportunity there. I have so far found no real advantage in sticking to dormitories in the later stages of the game except for them being not too costly, but uh, if you guys know any other advantage of the dormitories between, uh, b besides being cheap, let me know. Because my personal impression is that you are always best off with flat houses. And since the situation was looking that dire, we're going to slap on up two here. So... The thing is, I might be willing to set up a lot of population here and the services for more civil... No, for, for the higher class in this area. I like to design one upper class um, sector. Flat houses are really not any real luxury, so to say. They are just an, a decent house. And, well... You get the idea. If you need to house a lot of people real quickly, build dormitories, though. That's my personal impression so far. Okay, so we have, I think, uh, covered all the things we were able to cover. Lavatory plus... Oh yeah, another canteen, so let's cover that one as last. And those are things you regularly should come up with over the course of the time, because otherwise your city's stability will suffer. So here we have a uh, another similar thing. So I see a lot of reds in the mining area, I see a lot of red there. No red all at all there. Some reds over there. So, well... Since the mining business is one that's going to be ever-expanding in terms of numbers, I will be putting up another canteen here, because I feel like that's a good spot to go to. Go to. So we're going to copy that room. Of course, another thing you can always do is to... Oh, I can't build over the... Cutting orders, I keep forgetting that. Another good thing you can always do is to try to fit in more people into the existing buildings, of course. This canteen here struck my eye as a building that really can be expanded easily. So let's pick on up all these immigrants and let's, let's leave it for now like this. So, we wanted to talk about soldiers, no? 
So let's check on out our archery range while well, it's getting there. So mm, let's use this one here. So last episode we have fetched ourselves bows and arrows. So let's set up a hypothetical squad of archers and melee people. The only thing we're not going to do is assign people to that. So, one squad is going to receive bows, and as you see here, every pip that we increase there gives us more ranged power into the squad, but reduces certain skills in, res in response. Archers have a low defense and a low offense. Offense in this case is melee skill, and a lower speed. And if we would be adding in weapons now, we would reduce the range power in return, but increase pierce damage and defense skill. So nobody is stopping you from doing something, some weirdness like this, and at the end of the day, your squad will be actually effective, but this is very resource intense. And to start out, I personally prefer to go for arrow quivers and bows for one squad, and the other way around. Here, the more pips you add in, the more power you get out of the equip, but also the drawbacks increase. And over here, you see the green bar here is showing how much equip we have for our design here. So here we need to set up a couple of people, and there. Let's pause the game so it doesn't go in accidentally. So as you see here, now we have two of 200 bows. This setting correlates to 200 bows. Every pip is corresponding to one bow per person. So one unit of gear per person. And you can expand that all the way up to eight suits of gear per person. That's for armor and weapons, and that's for bows, only quivers you can stack up more. If I understood it correctly, quivers are merely providing ammo. I'm not sure if it does anything else, I think just that's their only purpose. So adding in them twice gives you more ammo, good stuff. So we are therefore going to make one squad work like that, and we're going to aim for, let's say, four bows per person, and on the other squad, four armors and four weapons per person. So that means we're gaining armor rating, offense skill goes down because armor is encumbering you, speed goes down, weight goes up. I don't know why weight is something positive, but somebody knows it likes me. And the weapons increase our pierce damage and our defense skill. So that's that. Over here are the meters for training we're going to touch these later what i wanted to come down with here is that's the number of gear we will need to have in store at all times because those guys will pick up their gear if they get drafted for combat that means our stockpiles now need to be at least 400 of each of these weapons to be to sport just one 50 man squad each. Military is a very costly thing in this game. And very work intense, but you know. You should by now know this game. Good enough. So that means we will need to produce the gear in sufficient amounts. We have already set up a facility for bows and arrows. As you see here, bows and arrows are really easy to set up, and they merely need leather and wood. And here only would. Oh, what I totally forgot to say. You can, of course, consider giving your archers some suits of armor as well, because that'll make them less vulnerable if they get attacked. But ideally, you want to avoid to get your dudes into melee in the first place. There's a lot of configuration room there. This is just one thing, one very, very basic, uh, very basic. Uh, the schematic that I want to use. Feel free to share me your ideas in the comment section. I'm very eager to see what how you guys are using these things. The, the one of you, the ones of you that know this military system good enough. So let's just move on forward a little bit. These extra immigrants that we pulled up there were a real boon for our odd job scene, 
and therefore we're going to get on quite nicely. I mean, right now the situation is a little bit un unhappy for the dudes, but at the end of the day, it'll be quite simple. We will have more services once these guys are uh, done with building, so there's going to be nothing bad happening about that. Okay, our second smithy is uh, up and running, that's a good thing. So we're going to provide tools at this place. We'll now have to check how many weapons this place is going to provide and if this is going to be enough for our squad. The problem about weapons and all that stuff is it has all a spoilage rate. So we will have to work against the spoilage, but I have a good feeling about our production rate here. The second smithy will still provide tools because tools get worn down as well and they need to be constantly replaced. Therefore, tools, just like clothes and all the other things, are something you will have a constantly new need of. Okay. Oh, by the way, look at that. The clay is rolling into town. Let's see. Maybe that's going to be the start of some happy drunk people. So, armor is way much of a deal than weapons are. Armor is the one hidden super boss enemy when it comes down to unlocking military in a larger scale. Forgive me the words. Armor can be produced in the first place add tailors. We have right now two tailors running for armor. They are able to produce a whopping amount of four armors per year. Crazy, huh? They are only consuming 63 units of leather per year as well, so let's not uh, be too mean about that. But besides that, this is the only way to fetch, out, fetch up armor in the early game. You can produce armor out of metal at a much more effective pace. I mean, my tailors are are, are tiny, don't get me wrong. That's really just a... Uh, don't get the wrong impression there. You can scale it up and have a nice production out of leather. But it comes... but it still boils down to the fact that you will need leather, and really large amounts of that, and refining leather into armor is really not as good as this recipe. You get much more out of your resource out of this. But to get there, you need to invest 700, 2000, 4100, 7000, 7800 knowledge points in total. Just to make your own armor. That's really hard. So I see two solutions for your early game needs. Either you just bite the bullet and you make it out of leather. That's absolutely not a uh, thing to feel bad about. If your map is not providing the leather in sufficient amounts for you, you can also consider importing it. Really a good thing to do. And if you are sporting enough hunters on your map, even better. And the other thing that is also a option is imports. I really gotta say, I mean, armor is quite costly on the market. In this scenario, we pay 280 for that. But as you see here, just these 32,000 denarii already would fetch us 113 suits of armor. Sure, it ain't much. It's only a quarter of what we need in total. But if you have a good economy that's really good at creating denarii, I would actually consider if I would be cutting all the workforce I'll need to make that stuff out of leather and just buy it. Because armor only has here again a quite low spoilage rate. I mean, there is spoiling rate. And as I surely have already mentioned, or at least I hope so, you can reduce the spoilage rate of stuff even further, especially the techs behind the warehouse tech are extremely potent, and you can scroll all the way over there, and not only do they rec reduce the spoilage stronger than the ones before, they also increase the carry capacity of your people, and therefore are really, really a highly recommendable thing. Now that we're dabbling into military, I'm definitely going to buy a couple of these, and 
So let's check this out. I have reduced spoilage by 0.75, and now the six person have transformed into four person. As you can see, there is a pretty hard diminishing returns ratio there, but the less spoilage, the better. I really wouldn't. Uh, I really can say this is one tech tree that you can't max out too early because it's just good. It makes your people more efficient, and it makes your goods go less bad. Just as a side note. Now, to get our thing really going, of course, we will now set up the pendant to the archery range. And that's being found in infrastructure. That's the training ground. So we're going to set up a training ground for our soldiers, just uh, parallel to the other thingy. So let's just set this up like that. You can create it with or without walls. We're... I personally prefer my training halls with walls, I don't know, gives me more of a civilized feeling. And here again, I'm keeping it big as you can see. There, I really don't see any good reason at this point of the game to go with really small numbers anymore, because it'll surely not do you any real favors there. So let's do this like that. Let's pillar this place. Oopsie. Of course, you can be way more creative than me with uh, how you shape your rooms. I'm a little bit notoriously uh, same-shaped, but that's also a thing about recording these episodes. I, I want to apply a template that's quickly working out that doesn't need my need much brain capacity of mine. So these things are really easy to set up. You just have to set up these training dummies. And since our room is shaped like that, I think it's going to be quite fun to make it like that. There we go. So let's at least have some decency and put them in line. Oh, I can't hear. No! Game, okay, why are you doing this to me? So, maybe I can replace the other guy. So we're leaving this at a capacity of 102 here. I had to eliminate this outlier. And we can expand that, as you see here. But we're not going to do this for now, because furniture is something that I want to spend right now into other things more directly. Alright, so let's make that happen, and this is going to be the place where we're going to train our warriors. So, as far as I've seen, as soon as your dudes are assigned to this sort of training, they use the training grounds, and if they are assigned to this kind of training, they use the archery range. I don't know how they handle if you do this like that but as you see here you can't assign them to more than four pips because four pips are the entirety of their work day so this is the next thing on the last thing that i wanted to explain for military in this episode so here you can assign how your soldiers are supposed to spend their day each pip of melee training gives you all these bonuses and each pip there gives you currency and range power so Technically, you can go for mixed troops, specialist troops, or militia troops, if I would uh, like, I would to call like I would want to call them. The thing here is, if you configure it like that, your dudes will spend a quarter of their time training and three quarters of their time working. If you configure them like that, they will spend all their time training and not be available for anything else so soldiers will always try to train until they hit a certain point and then they go off but their skill so to say degrades and somebody who you would you tell to maintain this kind of uh, skill level has to work non-stop to maintain these bonuses the downside is these guys are not available for anything else. I'm personally a big fan of adjusting my, my squads to a full-time schedule, if I can't afford that, because I personally think a well-trained military is worth a ton. 
but let me know how you guys handle these things. I'm really, really eager to know because my experiences with this military system are rather limited. I have fully understood the metrics and how things work together, but I am lacking experience to compare to. So feel free to add in these blacks for us. Okay, so the training ground, as you see here, does not need any weapons unlike the archery range but i mean i find that quite realistic that the archery range doesn't work uh without the proper gear whereas the training ground does not necessarily need the need you to come with weapons you can also bring the weapons to the training ground but the same could be said about the archery range but you get the idea i'm not sure why the archery range needs that many weapons so our next goal now is to make sure that we can stockpile the goods that we need for our military. So we have already assigned a lot of work, a lot of jobs. So we're going to assign the next job as a planned thing. So since smithing armor is so out of reach, I'm going to whip up a tailor here. That's going to give us the ability to provide armor in a larger scale. So we're going to set up one tailor's shop of this size here. Probably something something bigger. Let's make that out of wood. We don't want to. Or ah, well, whatever. Let's make it stone. And let's just do our usual shtick. And this place will now be providing for us armor exclusively. I am pretty sure that there will be the point where my hunters will be not able to keep up with the hunger of my of my armor makers. But that's really not a bad thing. If that happens, you always should check out if your economy is able to... Oh, slavers. Um, is you, if your economy is able to import that stuff, because importing leather and selling it off as armor is always turning out a profit. It's always turning out to be a profit. So you are absolutely able to transform these goods into profit, even if you. Um, don't need them anymore for your military. You don't even need to stop importing these goods. That's really powerful. So, as you see here, I'm going totally nuts. We're almost uh, hosting 45 people, uh, um, almost 50 people in here. But that's exactly what I had in mind. Let's just hope that I can fit in enough auxiliaries here to make this magic happen. So we are at 81% effective efficiency. So the longer you play this game, the more you will be playing Tetris with this game. Quite an enjoyable task. I bet you could have fit in way more workers than I did here, but that doesn't matter. This place here is damn costly. As you see here, this is one hell of an investment. So we're going to suspend that job for the time being until we have found enough material to work with. We are now going to put a in a increased strain on our metal output, so let's keep an eye out on that as well. This is one thing you really need to check out with this game. Whenever you start increasing your your production at at one point, you're putting on strain to another part of your system. And you might want to check out if your system can handle that extra strain. In this situation, I, or I immediately saw that my metal storages are, are starting to deplete. Because we are using way more metal than before now, of course. I mean, it doesn't come as a big surprise. So we're now going to amp up this place. You heard me say this quite often, and I'll say it again. I always prefer to set up my workshops in a way that I don't need to refurniture them in, the, in between, because now nobody is working in here until all of this is done, and it's always bothering me, and I 
I dislike it when my productions have to stand still until something has been refurnitured, you know. Alright, so now we have more than enough room for tons of workers in there. That's a good thing. So, let's see. The lavatory is done. We have one flat house finished. This flat house ain't finished. And the canteen ain't finished either. So, there's a lot of uh, blanks that we have to fill first. So. Also have to keep out an eye on my ore supply. So, before this will turn into any issue, we might be just increasing our percentage of ore imports right away. Because there's one good thing about ore, it doesn't go bad at all. So, we got this. Now, this will now, of course, uh, take a bit of, little bit of time until it is all done. And I find it very confusing, but for some reason I suspended the job inside the building, but all people are very, very keen on finishing the building first. I'll let them do. It's just something that I don't have the patience to micromanage. And we have now successfully set up the basics of our military, the basic infrastructures. We are producing armor, weapons, bows and quivers in a really good amount. We are also, well, we are not done with providing the good amount, but you get the idea. We are also expanding our service network and our city is getting more and more ready to hop on over into the actual training of soldiers, which is going to be hopefully a topic for the next episode. I'm not quite sure where the next episode will actually, as a matter of fact, take me. So we're going to see where that'll head bring us. Oh gosh, look at that. Here we had, this happens when you have cutting orders in between your wall building orders. Not a good thing. Um, I'm not quite sure where the next episode will will get us, but I'll surely uh, come up with something. So we will still have to produce all these things and therefore it is actually a really good idea to think about things that we can do in between because patience is the name of the game. Don't try to rush things too hard in this game or it will backlash quite hot into your face. Have the patience with these buildings to let them be finished. Have a keen eye on your supply lines and all those things and you won't suffer any too dramatic uh, things in your gameplay. Now then, so thanks for watching everybody. We have now the set, the basics of military set up, and let's see where we'll we be where we will be headed in the next. <laughs> so drop me your comments down below. Leave me your thumbs up if you enjoyed, and of course consider subscribing. I'd be delighted to have you, and there's daily content coming up on my channel. I wish you a wonderful day, and thanks for your time.